month I mentioned on social media that I was going to talk about what a cult is. It's a really important topic for two reasons. One is that some people generalize and say that everything is a cult, which is just not true. Saying this camouflages some really evil stuff going on in the world. It's kind of a blanket moral relativism. And number two, there are some things that are indeed very culty and defining it clearly would help people spot some problematic groups they might be involved in. There's like relationships and families that behave like cults. There are corporations and political parties that when properly analyzed are indistinguishable from cults. Okay, so what is a cult? I'm gonna get to that. In the space of cult education and deprogramming, there are many people that have done incredible work in this field already. Members of ICSA, the International Cultic Studies Association, Yanya Lalich, Rick Ross, and Steve Hassan with his very detailed and comprehensive bite model. I'm going to put links to all their work in the show notes or if you're on YouTube in the description below. I think that they're all very astute people. And what I'm going to present is not a challenge to their definitions and lists, but rather my particular view on cults and cult dynamics. Remember, I'm not a clinician or an academic, just someone who's been seriously deceived and figured some shit out. There are a few things that are important when going through lists like these. One of the things I see happening is that people who are actually in cults read these kinds of checklists and say, well, this doesn't really apply to me, only to other groups. It's really important to become a student of pattern recognition when looking at systems like these. You know, you could discount a point by saying, well, you know, we didn't pray or we didn't meditate or we didn't eye gaze or I don't know, we didn't wear white or we didn't call them priests or we didn't make offerings. Those are the specifics. We need to pull further back to see the generalities, the pattern. One group may call something meditation, another focusing, another sitting in presence, but they're not really that different. They're just different words. So why do people feel the need to argue that their thing or ritual is different from the others? I think it's because it's very hard for people to look at these lists and truly, without being emotionally vested, analyze their situation and say, yeah, you know, I might be in a group like this. This thing I'm involved in might be an abusive relationship or might be a cult. It's critical to remain as open-minded as possible and be willing to question whatever situation you're in and see if there are matches to cult characteristics. It's also important to note that people who are in these coercive or cultic environments have resistance towards these lists. They will justify what they're doing and try to separate themselves from the pattern being exposed in the list. There's a curious thing that happens in the human brain. I know many people who stand for nonviolence and against coercion, and yet I see them being coercive towards other people. And then when questioned, they say things like, well, you know, that's not coercion. This is for their own good or for the good of society at large. You know that saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? There's a rather common inability of people to recognize that the thing they say is bad is the thing they're actually part of. It's cognitive dissonance. To give you a clear and completely bizarre example of this blind spot, when I was still in Nixium, one of the books Ranieri recommended to a few of us was Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, a study of brainwashing in China by Robert J. Lifton. We were literally studying what he was doing to us, but we couldn't fathom the possibility. I highly recommend this book as it's a, it's a chilling study of what we're currently going through as a society. Lifton's research for the book began in 1953 with a, a series of interviews he did with American soldiers who had been held captive during the Korean War. In addition to these interviews, he interviewed 15 Chinese citizens who had fled their homeland after being subjected to indoctrination in Chinese universities. So from these interviews, Lifton identified the tactics used by Chinese communists to cause drastic shifts in opinion and personality, in essence, to brainwash American soldiers. I'll get to my list in a moment, but it's worth mentioning that in his book, Lifton outlines the eight criteria for thought reform. They are milieu control, 
mystical manipulation, demand for purity, confession, sacred science, loading the language, doctrine over person, and dispensing of existence. If this is of interest to you, do yourself a favor and study Lifton's work. It's as relevant today as it was when he wrote it. Okay, so what is a cult? We could try and narrow it down to a very simple definition. For example, Amy Morin, LCSW, says, A cult is an organized group whose purpose is to dominate cult members through psychological manipulation and pressure strategies. Cults are usually headed by a powerful leader who isolates members from the rest of society. That's actually a pretty good high-level generalized definition. In my experience, a single short definition is useful, but what I'd like to do is get into the numerous characteristics that make up a cult. So I'm going to give you my list of cult characteristics and tactics. There are 25 of them. Number one, pathology. The leader of a cultic group often has some kind of cluster B pathology, at minimum malignant narcissism. This could actually go all the way up to sociopathy or psychopathy. And the thing is, very often, it's covert. They might wear a mask or veneer of goodness to use their followers' hopes and dreams to entrap them. They will appeal to their followers' most cherished values. But the followers are always reminded the leader is the superior being, and they have a lot to do to try and reach this you know, greatness. The followers are left in a never-ending spiral of self-doubt, uh, shame, and low self-esteem, while the cult leader gains fuel from their adoration and obedience. Do yourself a favor, check out the work of Daniel Shaw, who wrote an amazing book called Traumatic Narcissism and Recovery, Leaving the Prison of Shame and Fear. One of the things he talks about in his book is how cult leaders activate deep shame in their followers while they themselves deny and abdicate their own shame and instead take on the mantle of a supernatural being. This tends to be common to malignant narcissists in general, but Daniel Shaw relates it specifically to cult leaders and authoritarian leaders. Followers are, by and large, good, well-meaning people with a conscience, and they cannot imagine their leader may not have any. They have to do all kinds of mental gymnastics to explain their leader's behavior, which is actually sadistic and Machiavellian. Critically important is waking up from this Pollyanna denial. It's the blind insistence that all other people have empathy just because you have it. An empathic person without the awareness of how all this works cannot truly make sense of a dark triad individual. But once they do, everything changes. Those of you who've seen The Vow on HBO saw my journey of waking up to who Ranieri really was. I assumed the lack of emotion he displayed was indicative of him being you know, emotionally and spiritually advanced. It never occurred to me I was dealing with a malignant pathology, an empty shell of a person masquerading as a human. One of the defenses followers use is saying things like, well, I've never seen these behaviors you're alleging. The leader has been nothing but kind to me. They may not have seen anything. Leaders with these pathologies are very strategic. They have a public persona and a private persona. Like how many times have you heard stories about people that only abuse their spouses or families when no one's looking? It's exactly the same pattern. The other defense against this is something called betrayal blindness. The victim will get angry at the person trying to wake them up rather than at the abuser. This is because truly acknowledging the betrayal and abuse would be too much for their psyche to handle. It's easier to lash out at the person trying to tell them the truth about the leader. Number two, love bombing. Entrance into the group can be a euphoric and seemingly transcendent experience. Participants report a feeling of finally belonging, finding their purpose, uh, finding their tribe or their people. In terms of a pattern, it's a complete match to the first stage in a relationship with a narcissist. You're showered with praise and they idealize you to the point that you become enamored with the way that they see you. You'll feel a sense of love and belonging that you may have yearned for your whole life. In a cult, the existing members are on their best behavior and give the newbie this unforgettable experience of community and high vibe excitement. 
It's by design. This will change once the newbie is part of the group. Then the devaluation and coercion will set in. The existing members can't see what they're participating in. They're being told that you know once the new recruit is in, they need to get them on the path of serious growth as fast as possible. So most people will rationalize the abuse as love as the existing members believe they're doing important work and the newbie is in essence desperately holding on to that initial high. These patterns of induction are an isomorphic metaphor for the early stages of the narcissistic abuse cycle. It's all the same. It's just different scales of coercion. It could be a cult of one or a cult of millions. Number three, obedience. The leader requires absolute unconditional obedience to themselves and the ideology. There's always some narrative as to why this should be so. Things like, in order for me to take you to enlightenment or ultimate awareness, you must relinquish your control or your insistence on self-protection. You must let go of your ego. So the follower, desperate for these promises of greatness, surrenders to the psychopath. In Ranieri's case, he sold the idea that slavery is freedom. Yeah, right out of 1984. The follower, by the way, does not necessarily think that they're an obedient automaton. They truly believe they have a choice. So if you were to ask them, you know, could they travel anywhere they want or associate with anyone they want, they might insist they can, but that's rarely the case. They do have some choices, you know, within an extremely narrow band of options. You know, can they serve anything other than the agenda of the cult? Absolutely not. Can they choose what branch of activity to be involved with inside the cult? To some degree, yes. This constraint is what Yanya Lalic calls bounded choice in her book of the same name. Number four, infantilization. The structure of the cultic community is such that the followers are infantilized by the leader. The leader regards themselves as a kind of parent or God to all their children and conversely, Followers feel like they are children and project attributes of, you know, mother and father onto the leader. Not only is this prevalent in religious cults or corporations, but also, you know, in society at large. Many people tend to look at their leaders as these, you know, all-powerful, all-wise parental figures and feel obedient to whatever they say. Think, for example, of news anchors on television. They're seen as somehow having some special knowledge they have the information, and they know something that we commoners don't know. It connects to a very primitive dynamic in humans. Cult leaders sell the idea that they will reparent or reprogram the followers to become great or, or holy or you know, whatever hogwash they're peddling. What they want to revel in is the feeling of control over their populace. It's part of their messianic complex. In order to break out of this trap, we need to individuate and grow up. And the truth is many people have still not individuated. By the way, I'm going to be doing a course discussing the psychology involved in each of these tactics and how to resist and break free from them. If that's something you'd be interested in, sign up on my mailing list on my website and you'll be the first to know when it goes live. All right. Number five, isolation. Just as in a relationship with a narcissistic abuser, the cultic system is designed to break down the participant so that they lose touch with friends, family, and even their own knowledge and intuition. They have to be isolated from their support system so that they can be bonded to the cult leader. Their former support system is seen as a threat by the leader. Therefore, it has to be dismantled. This isolation is achieved by convincing the follower that their former friends and family do not have their best interests at heart and are in fact holding them back. It's this terrible trap because usually um, friends and family are the ones that are deeply concerned and want to help. But every concern they voice becomes proof they don't approve of the followers in your life. The followers will defend against this by saying that they now realize they need supportive people around them, not these people. They want people at the same frequency or who hold similar values. They might even buy into the cult leader's paranoia that their former friends and family are trying to block them from their growth, their dreams, and importantly, the pursuit of the mission to save the world. 
Number six, the mission. Early on, the follower is shown that this movement or group that they're in is so much bigger than each of them. There is a very important mission that requires absolute devotion and commitment. It's life and death because if they don't succeed, humanity and civilization will fall. They need to save the world. So the common denominator for people who join cults is that they're idealists. That's how many of them get hooked. That's how I got hooked. The mission they are offered mirrors their greatest hopes and dreams. They're being sold a kind of utopia, a utopian collectivist ideology. That utopia is like a drug to a seeker who wants desperately to help the world become a better place. But there's so many issues with this. Firstly, it's the on-ramp to fascism and a totalitarian community. Secondly, it's a lie. It's the bait being used to capture them, keep them enslaved to the ideology, and it makes it very hard for them to leave. The follower begins to think that this mission, their own values, and the great and noble leader are all one and the same thing. To give up the group and the mission is to give up their most cherished values, and they'd rather die than do that. They become trapped inside their own vision of goodness. And so their defense to outsiders is things like, well, don't you think it's important to make the world a better place? And of course, who's going to say no to that? But to the leader, who's a wolf in sheep's clothing, the mission is the perfect ruse. It's flying the flag of service to enslave the followers. And this pattern, by the way, can be seen in NGOs and charities that are run by malignant narcissists. This leads to the next one. Number seven, doctrine over person. This term comes from the work of Robert J. Lifton. In a cult, the mission or ideology is seen as more important than the individual person. This means that you need to put aside all your personal concerns, your need for comfort, and even your need for self-preservation. The mission could be saving a species, saving the earth, saving sinners' souls, or saving the world from some dark force. Essentially, the battle is so large and so important that you're just a small cog who must sacrifice everything. You're told that your humanity is flawed and lesser than this great ideology. Your humanity is weak. In fact, your humanity is the problem. I've been in spiritual and environmental groups where humanity is seen as disgusting and parasitic. This promotes profound self-hatred and, of course, is anti-humanity. It causes cognitive dissonance because you're told love of self is important, but also that you're a piece of shit. It's completely unresolvable um, until you exit the coercive environment. Doctrine of a person, by the way, is a growing malaise in our society at the moment. Number eight, breaking boundaries. The leader will use the followers' values to convince them that their resistance, which you know could be justifiable suspicion they might actually have, is part of their problem. Their growth is being hampered by their inability to truly surrender, the cult leader says. Their boundaries are causing limitations. This sets them up for all kinds of abuse, physical, sexual, and financial. The cult leader points out that your discomfort is a sign that you're unhealed or resistant. It's a barrier to your greatness. This opens the door to abuse because any resistance to what is being done to you is your limitation. It's extremely convenient for the leader who wants to walk all over your boundaries and do whatever they want. Pretty soon, the follower feels that any resistance they have to anything being asked of them is part of their problem. So they become complicit in shattering their own boundaries and healthy sense of self. The follower will defend this by calling it healthy, full transparency. Number nine, data mining. In order for the leader to get some kind of leverage, they have to look for the follower's weaknesses, fears, insecurities, and desires. Early on in the induction process, there might be lengthy intake forms or sessions where the followers are required to divulge their struggles. This is for their own good, the leader says, to help free them. Secrets are unhealthy, the followers are taught. All this information will be used later to control them. 
one of the most useful questions in this data mining process is what is your greatest fear? This will be brought back up when the follower is resistant. Don't you want to get over that fear? Do you want to be ruled and controlled by your fear your whole life? Or do you want freedom? See, your fears might be used to push you, but also to control you. Let's say your greatest fear is abandonment. One day in the cult, your conscience cries out and you resist something you're being urged to do. Knowing that you have this fear, the leader will use this to force your hand. They might withdraw their attention or the affection of the entire group. The potential of being shunned for not complying will feel kind of like death to you. In the worst case, whatever information they gather on you can be used as straight out blackmail. Because of all the data mining, they know exactly how to play you. Number 10, special knowledge. The cult leader promotes the narrative that he or she has some special knowledge or abilities that are being given to the followers. The leader often has an elitist or you know, messianic worldview and tells the followers that they are special or chosen. This can be part of the love bombing phase. The leader convinces the followers that he or she has the knowledge to truly understand reality and no one else does. And here's the kicker. The followers have this capacity to get it as well because they're in this group. It's a shared fantasy that is often detached from reality. And what it does is it, it activates a narcissistic impulse in the followers, which makes them feel superior to all others. If you've experienced being the black sheep of the family or you know, marginalized in some way, this is like an addictive drug. In some groups, there's the belief that they have you know, a unique mathematical paint by numbers methodology to understand the human psychodynamic. In other groups, the followers are told that they're gods. In others, they're one of the few chosen who will survive the coming cataclysm. This specialness bonds the followers to the leader who is the giver of this so-called mind-blowing information, but also creates a division between the cult members and the rest of society. I want to take a quick break to tell you that one of the things I would love to do is put out more content about all the things that fascinate me and hopefully you. I'm on a personal mission to expose patterns of abuse and coercion and the many forms it takes at multiple scales in society. Accomplishing this endeavor takes two things, time and resources. If you like what I'm doing, I would love your help in achieving this. I've started a Patreon account as a way to get support for this podcast and channel. I'll also be offering some exclusive content over there that you might enjoy. So please head over to patreon.com forward slash Mark Vicente to help support my endeavors so I can keep things going. Thank you. All right, let's continue. Number 11, us versus them. Fear is this powerful motivator. You can bind a group very tightly by having them unify against a common enemy, even if it's completely fabricated and false. All that matters is that the followers believe it. First step, paint a picture of the enemy. This is accomplished using keywords, names, suppressive, terrorist, communist, you know, radical, subversive, anti, fill in the blank. Anyone who does not believe in the ideology of the group is to be avoided and classified with these terms. And the leader may give lip service to the idea that we must unify all people and all people should be loved. But in actuality, there's us and the great unwashed, unclean, deviant, ignorant, evil others. While it solidifies the followers into fervent devotees, it creates an enormous amount of stress in their psyches. They cannot successfully hold these two opposing thoughts in their mind and can become quite psychotic in their hatred of who they have been told is the enemy. On a societal level, you can see this deranged behavior in social media. Highly intelligent and educated people who say they're committed to compassion and civilized conduct become vile to the people they've been told are the enemy. And when challenged on this, they cannot even go there. It's like it's filed away in some part of their brain they don't have access to. 
It takes a very strong person to admit they fell for the ruse and made grave errors in judgment. Us versus them is an incredibly important thing to understand, as it's the fuel that currently fires most, if not all, political campaigns. Just a side note, in my list, I'm not going to spend time on things like hierarchical structures or the requirements to enroll others, because while those are definitely present in cults, they're also common in many industries. However, I do want to address number 12, accumulation of wealth at the expense of the followers. Cult leaders are typically obsessed with accumulating wealth and power. In order to do this, they have to keep their overhead as low as possible, and in some cases get the wealthier followers to donate their own money to the cause. The cult leader's workforce is the devoted followers who are volunteering their time, effort, and actual life force. The cult leader will convince the volunteers that working for the mission is a great privilege and should not be looked down upon. The followers, whose you know, self-esteem and self-worth have already been worn down, buy in and become the unpaid workforce. The leader will accumulate financial wealth, houses, you know, cars, planes, expensive clothes, while the followers often live in abject poverty, struggling to put food on the table. The justification for this disparity is that the leader needs to be able to interact with the normal world at a very high level in order to change it, they say. They have to look good to materialistic people. So when friends and family question the follower on their poverty, the response could be something like, well, you know, money isn't everything, or materialism is the big problem in the world, or things like, would you rather me be happy or stinking rich? Because I would hope you would champion my happiness. None of these arguments make any sense. But the follower has been programmed to reject what they call materialism. The cult leader, meanwhile, embraces materialism with vigorous lust. Number 13, constantly busy. The participants or devotees are kept constantly busy with very little time to think or engage in the outside world. This can involve long hours of prayer or meditation or being kept busy with work to the point of sleep deprivation. There's new committees to address new problems, you know, impossible workloads, multiple job descriptions, endless tasks, needing to be present every time the leader wants to address their flock, uh, spaces to be cleaned and reorganized, emergency tasks that require you to drop everything, but you're still responsible for failing on the thing you had to drop. Sleep deprivation is key here. The more tired the followers are, the less cognitive function they have to rationally question stuff that just does not make sense. It keeps them docile and irrational. The followers could be required to try to solve impossible situations or just perform mindless tasks, convincing themselves that it has to have something to do with the mission. We wouldn't be asked to do it if it wasn't important, right? And then there are always emergencies in a cult, either a real or perceived attack from the outside, a suppressive on the inside, a member who wants to leave, or someone breaking a rule. The followers now have to work harder or commit more deeply in order to resolve the problem. And then there's damage control, so much damage control, which the cult leader blames on the followers. If they only worked harder or kept their eye on the ball, the leader wouldn't have to be dealing with attacks from the world and dark forces out to get him or her. What cult leaders do is instill fear and confusion in the cult population because of the terrible threat out there, and then they provide the answers. What none of the followers realize is that the problem was created by the leader, either due to their sloppiness or in purpose. And nothing pulls people together more than a crisis that threatens the mission. And the crisis will usually arise when the leader has been questioned about something shitty they did. The political equivalent of the film Wag the Dog. And by the way, the similarities to our current political world are painfully obvious. Friends and family will notice this insane busyness with the person they love. They may say things like, why don't we just spend some time together hanging out, you know, just being. In the follower's mind, doing nothing is almost sinful as it steals from actualizing the mission. And the irony is that while they're killing themselves for the mission, the cult leader is hanging out and relaxing a lot. Number 14, responsibility with no authority. 
The followers, who are now the cult workforce, are made to feel responsible for everything bad that happens, but have no authority to change anything. Typically, everything good that happens is caused by the leader, everything bad by the followers. The followers are told that they're not devout enough. They're having negative thoughts. They're not standing up for the leader enough. They're cowards, whatever the insult. They are 100% responsible, but have no ability to do anything about it. It's a very convenient system. The cult leader can do any number of stupid, immoral, or criminal things, and they are not to blame for the consequences. This pattern erodes the self-esteem the followers might have had that they can create and affect change in their lives. Hopelessness sets in, and they just put one foot in front of the other, goalless and lacking in any ambition outside the confines of the cult. Number 15, redefining morality. In a cult, you learn pretty soon that there is a societal morality and the superior morality, which can be amorality, of the group. In order to shift the follower from societal morality to this new morality of the cult, the leader has to show the issues with societal morality. And it's not that hard to point out that society is pretty much full of shit. Leaders in society insist their activities are moral and righteous, but they're clearly doing immoral things at times. Pointing out these inconsistencies makes the cult leader's job pretty easy. The idea is to get the follower to buy into the cult's more evolved morality. One of the ways this is accomplished is through what Lifton calls loading the language. By redefining terms and words and giving them new meanings, you're literally hacking the person's psyche. In Nixium, ethics was defined as consistency and dissociated from the concept of morality. As long as you were consistent, you were ethical. And the thing is, when you start messing around with people's deep beliefs of what is good and what is bad, it can cause an abandonment of long-held core beliefs. Now the cult can easily encourage behavior that is considered immoral or illegal in mainstream society, such as sexual exploitation, abuse, or criminal activities. The leader may justify these actions by claiming that they're necessary to achieve the higher goals of the mission, which include protecting the group from external threats. Cults redefine morality in ways that serve their own interests, rather than the interests of the members or society as a whole. In essence, they manipulate the members into accepting their moral code as the only valid one, and then they use this as a tool for control and manipulation. Cult members defend their new moral high ground by comparing it to societal corruption, which is unfortunately very easy to do. Number 16, coercion and control. One of the noticeable traits of malignant narcissists is a pathological need for control. They try to control everything and everyone in their orbit. What you eat, you know, who you spend time with, what you do and what you think. At the extreme, it becomes a messianic fantasy. They want to be a god in control of everything. In a cultic system run by such an individual, there is a constant atmosphere of fear. There's always the prospect of punishment for stepping out of line. Examples will be made of people who question the narrative or defectors from the mission, and everybody knows it. My warrior wife, Bonnie Peace, famously said, any system that uses guilt, shame, coercion, bullying, and fear as a tool of control is highly problematic. It doesn't just happen in a personal growth cult. It's everywhere. A term used in discussions on domestic abuse or intimate partner violence is coercive control. Coercive control is a pattern of controlling behaviors that creates an unequal power dynamic in a relationship, making it difficult for the victim to leave. It erodes a person's autonomy and self-esteem through acts of intimidation, threats, and humiliation. Cultic coercion is basically coercive control at a larger scale. The cult leader is basically abusing a large family. Everything and everyone is controlled and monitored, and you're punished for stepping out of line. And the thing is, coercion is a very difficult thing for people to see. Firstly, it can happen very, very slowly, and it's not clearly codified in our laws. Check out the work of the Consent Awareness Network. 
They're working very hard to get a definition of consent in penal codes everywhere. Their definition of consent is FGKIA. Consent is freely given, knowledgeable, informed agreement by a person with the capacity to reason. Number 17, secrecy and lies. I describe a cult as being very much like the NSA or CIA in terms of the way it handles information. Information is on a need-to-know basis, and there's a great deal of compartmentalization. There's a culture of secrecy that the lower ranks learn pretty soon not to challenge. It also means that nobody has the full picture of what's really going on, except for the cult leader. The entire system becomes an extension of the paranoid delusion of the leader. Also, to protect the mission, you're encouraged to lie to the outsiders. In Nixium, on day one, we were taught a class called Honesty and Disclosure. It started with a series of questions. What is honesty? Is not honest dishonest? Is dishonest bad? Can one ever be 100% honest? During the debrief from the head trainer, we were given an example from World War II. The Nazis come to your door to look for Jews. You are, in fact, hiding Jews in your basement. When the Nazis question you, do you tell them the truth or do you lie? Of course, you lie. This then becomes conflated with all authority. Because the cult educational model has already established that everybody outside of the system is corrupt, immoral, and likely evil, lying is justified. It's okay because it's for a higher purpose. The mission and the leader must be protected at all costs. When a family asks a follower why the secrecy and lies, the follower will state that they're an open book. Ask me anything they say. But their responses are often rehearsed talking points and circular word salad. Number 18, spying on each other. In order for the cult leader to have their finger on the pulse of their followers, they have to create a system of reporting back up the chain of command. A system where everybody checks in on everyone else. In other words, spies on everyone else. On the surface, it's called accountability or care or something that sounds benevolent. But what it really is, is a system where everybody is spying and reporting on each other. Looking back in history, this system shows up in authoritarian regimes where for the good of the party, problematic individuals had to be reported and weeded out. This would result in public humiliation or corrective punishment. In Nixium, a coach tree system was used to disseminate information down to the lower ranks, but it was also used to report problems up the ranks to the leader. In other cults, mentoring or healing sessions may be used to flag problems in the followers. It becomes an environment filled with fear and paranoia. You don't want to be the person who steps out of line and gets reported. When challenged by an outsider, the cult member will insist this is all about caring for others, a neighborhood watch of sorts. It's definitely not that. This then leads to number 19, confession. This one is so insidious because it utterly breaks a person down. When a follower strays from the path, in other words, you know, breaks some of the Orwellian rules, the cause of their error needs to be revealed so it won't happen again. This is framed as something that is good for the person and the system at large. A lack of transparency is seen as a flaw in the follower. Remember, you are not allowed to have boundaries. Private, unexpressed thoughts are a problem. In Maoist China, struggle sessions or denunciation rallies were violent public spectacles where people accused of being class enemies were publicly humiliated, accused, beaten, and tortured by people with whom they were close. Usually conducted at the workplace, classrooms, and auditoriums where students were pitted against their teachers. Friends and spouses were pressured to betray one another, and children were manipulated into exposing their parents. Often, out of desperation, the targeted person would confess to things they never said or did. Social media, by the way, has become the modern-day equivalent of a Maoist struggle session. Confess your transgressions or else. In a cult, a system of confession is used for multiple purposes. To gather secret information from the followers, to normalize not having 
privacy or boundaries, and to encourage self-punishment and self-hatred. This results in having you know, little or no self-esteem and absolutely no ability to fight the system. Revealing one's innermost secrets is just part of the culture. In Nixium, if you failed or breached, you would do a number of things. Firstly, write a detailed breach report and then a breach plan of how you would fix it. You were then required to go and apologize to all the many people your failure affected. This could also involve standing in front of the entire class doing a grand confession. In other words, I'm sorry that I'm such a piece of shit, I will try harder. Number 20, triangulation. Very common in cultic communities is that the followers are having all kinds of disputes with one another. Some of it's just normal human social behavior. Some of it is purposely instigated by the cult leader. The leader triangulates members against each other to keep them in conflict for two reasons. One is to keep them so distracted and exhausted that it wears them down. The other is to be the arbitrator and savior. In Nixium, Raniere had everybody at each other's throats and if begged for help, would come to arbitrate. It just so happens that many of those at each other's throats were also his lovers. He instigated jealousy on purpose. On a smaller scale, you can see triangulation used by a malignant narcissist. They turn those around them against each other, especially against their target. On a societal scale, entire political groups are riled up against each other. They're so busy fighting that it camouflages what the leader or leaders are doing. As Sun Tzu said, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. But I would add, let them fight each other. Number 21, mystical science. Another important hallmark of a cult is a spiritual or scientific understanding that the leader says unifies the true nature of life and reality, the true cause and effect of the universe. Maybe it's something like your thoughts create all reality. You are the only true architect of your life. The frequency you are vibrating at attracts similar frequencies and experiences. It's your karma. Every opinion you have is a projection. You know, you are causing your misfortune and illness. You can live forever if you overcome your humanity and increase your vibration. Okay, so fragments of these theories might have some truth in them, but they get applied to all of reality. Now, let me clarify. This kind of thinking exists in all of society. Having these ideas as theories or musings is not the issue. It's when they get enforced as the one and only grand unified theory of existence that the trouble starts. These dogmatic precepts direct the thinking and behavior of the followers, sometimes causing them to make poor and often detrimental decisions. They become less reality-based and more delusional. There's often a simpler explanation for why things are happening, but the follower now isolated from reality clings to the mystical ideology as though their life depends on it. This worldview that they believe in often excuses the behavior of the cult leader. When things don't make sense, the leader can refer to the mystical science as the explanation. The leader might insist that they have a higher perspective and can see things the followers can't see or understand. It can easily become a form of institutionalized gaslighting. When friends and family challenge the follower on their alleged science, they can be very dogmatic and assume an air of superiority. They are beyond these logical questions, they think. Their loved ones might be tempted to try and outlogic them, but it's important to remember, the cult member is not using logic, they're using emotions. The mystical science they're holding onto gives them relief from some kind of pain, you know, confusion or insecurity. And the problem is the only person who benefits from this is the cult leader. Number 22, Darvo. Jennifer Freyd, a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon, coined the term DARVO. It stands for Deny, Attack, and Reverse Victim and Offender. This is an sort of unspoken modus operandi in cults. It's a large-scale tactic employed by narcissists in general. The leader and the ideology can never be at fault. It must be the follower that is at fault. Any concern or objection the follower has is turned around on them. 
they are actually to blame. Sometimes this is overt and sometimes it's actually covert. And what do I mean by that? Well, sometimes this reversal is baked into the teachings. In Nixium and some other high control groups, the concept of being at cause was introduced. You were taught that the more you could recognize your responsibility in all things, the more power you had. So the question would always be asked, how did you cause this thing you are unhappy with? Being at cause was recognizing how you caused and created all things in your life. If you had a concern or were upset, you were prompted to find your responsibility in it. Maybe it was your thoughts, maybe it was your energy, maybe it was your doubt or disbelief, or maybe you were harboring resentments against the leader, which you were told was your projection. This ideology is so convenient because it holds the abusive cult leader and the system completely blameless. In a cult, every problem is turned against the individual, sometimes with syrupy sweetness and sometimes with passive aggressive rage. Deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. Number 23, gaslighting. It's related to Darvo, but requires its own mention. Gaslighting is not simply someone disagreeing with you. This word gets thrown around a lot. When someone responds to you with a contrary viewpoint that you don't like, that is not gaslighting. Gaslighting is a deliberate attempt to convince you that your perception of reality is an error. Word of the year for 2022, according to Merriam-Webster, they define it as the act or practice of grossly misleading someone, especially for one's own advantage. You've likely heard stories of arguments where the target of a narcissist tries to address something that actually did happen, and the narcissist insists it never did. It goes kind of something like this. You were talking to your ex again, weren't you? No, I wasn't. I can see the phone call log right here on your phone. First of all, why are you looking at my phone? And secondly, why do you always get unstable when I talk to other people? So you did call her. I didn't. I think you need help. You're beginning to imagine things. Ironically, the narcissist is icy calm and the target is getting visibly upset. This kind of dynamic is designed to have the target question their reality. Maybe they are wrong. Maybe they did imagine it. He seems so sure of himself and it often ends in reactive abuse. In a cult, the followers may see things that are obviously problematic or immoral. The leader will then explain to them they did not see what they thought they saw. They are examining the event through their own filters and immature projections. Eventually, the followers no longer trust their own judgment and instincts. As George Orwell wrote in 1984, the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and your ears. It was their final, most essential command. A perfect example of this in general society is when you watch a government spokesperson for an authoritarian leader flat out lie about what is going on. They'll use doublespeak to confuse the press and the audience. If they're doing evil things, they might describe it as forwarding the cause of freedom and democracy. The recipient of this narrative might know it's a lie, but if that lie is repeated again and again, they begin to lose touch with actual reality. Number 24, information control. For the cult to maintain its control over everyone, information must be managed very carefully. There's an official narrative that is put out by the leadership, which is often a complete lie, about what is going on inside the cult and in the outside world. Think of it as state or corporate controlled media. You are only fed information that benefits those seeking control. This narrative is used to maintain the us versus them mentality, but also to keep the followers away from any sources of information that would be a threat to the cult leader's control. There is approved information that everybody is fed 24 seven, and then the forbidden other information. All other sources are to be feared, excluded, hated, ridiculed, and forbidden. If you dare bring up other sources of information, you will experience consequences. You're forbidden to speak freely and openly about any concerns you have with the practices of the leader or the organization. In other words, it's censorship. Now, here's an interesting thing. The people who are on board with the narrative do not see any censorship. They're clueless. Because they believe the narrative so ardently, they never bump up against its boundaries. 
they have no idea why the fringe lunatics are causing trouble and being so dramatic. In Nixium, Ranieri would talk to us about being in a war against hate, a war against people who were promoting hate. It turns out those people promoting so-called hate were trying to warn us about him. Later, us whistleblowers would become characterized as promoting hate. Just because the leader is labeling people with some terrible and scary word does not mean they're actually bad people. They may be trying to help you. It might be the very opposite of what you're being told to believe. It's important to note that if you bring something up in a group and there's a violent reaction to your thoughts or statements, you're probably in a cult. You might believe you're free, but you're not. Now, in order for all this to work, all other sources that oppose the official narrative have to be poisoned. This brings us to the final characteristic of a cult. Number 25, the smear campaign. In the cycle of narcissistic abuse, one of the last stages is the smear campaign. This is a way for the narcissist to avoid scrutiny and accountability for the shit they're doing. Similarly, this happens in cults at all scales. The leader has some activity that they've done or are doing that they want kept secret, usually because if the followers found out, they would be very shocked, likely leave or even destroy the cult. In order for the leader to maintain control and worship, he or she has to make sure the followers stay completely in the dark. It can be hard to control the flow of all dangerous information, but what they can do is manage the image of the whistleblowers sharing that information. So how do you do that? By poisoning the image of these truth speakers so no one trusts them. Building on the us versus them idea, the whistleblower has to be turned into a them, a dangerous, unstable, hateful, bigoted, irresponsible, anti-humanitarian liar. Whatever label is applied to them has to be something truly upsetting or scary to the followers, something that goes against their most cherished values. They're so caught up in their own hatred of this person and what they supposedly stand for, they don't bother to question if what they're being told is true. Now, any information that comes from this source is ignored, hated, and even ridiculed. It's usually vitally important information, but they're too far gone. They've become an unconscious mob. No matter how much you try to convince them that you're not this person, they cannot take it in. You are now Satan, and their abusive cult leader is God. So these are my 25 characteristics of a cult. I could honestly do an entire episode on each of these points, but I was kind of aiming for brevity. If any of this is familiar to you in the group you're currently involved in, it's worth examining. And if you feel resistant to examining it, that's also worth examining. If you find yourself thinking, well, you know, this is such a limited perspective. He obviously does not understand enlightenment and the spiritual journey. That thought you're having is really worth looking at. Insisting you have a godlike superiority over us mere mortals might be a belief system worth investigating. It's really quite wonderful down here with us mortals. If you suspect someone is in a cult, do yourself a favor. Do not tell them they're in a cult. That word has been poisoned by the leader. At most, you might want to call it a high control group or a high demand group. Do me a favor, read the first article in the show notes. That was the very first article my wife had me read to help deprogram me. In terms of your friends and family stuck in a cult, do not fight them. Don't ridicule them. They're in the equivalent of an authoritarian regime and they have completely bought into the ideology. Don't give them ammunition to believe that you are the enemy by attacking them. Stay interested in their perspective and above all, be loving and kind. One day, they might compare what they're told is love in the cult to the actual love you're giving them and realize they prefer your unconditional kindness to the fear and punishment they're experiencing. And the other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be doing a course discussing the psychology involved in each of these tactics and how to resist and break free from them. If that is something you'd be interested in, sign up on my mailing list on my website and you'll be the first to know when it goes live. I really hope this has been helpful. Please share it with as many people as you can 
who might want to gain an understanding of how all this works. And don't forget to head over to my Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash Mark Vicente. And above all, stay curious. Thank you.